Thank you everyone for coming down today. So uh, my name is Ming from the Web Finance team. And today's topic is about CSM.js. So, <laughs> so, okay, uh, so about a year ago, so there was a wise man who once asked out of the team, shall we use CSS in JS? And we took it to a vote. So uh, he was very wise, but somehow we, I remember that the team overwhelmingly voted against it at that time. So I thought it was the, would be the last, last time I would hear about this topic, CSS in JS, but I was wrong. So it wasn't until a few months ago that I stumbled upon something that is so strange that uh, completely changed the way I think about this topic. So the more I look into CSA in JS, uh, the more I am fascinated by it and by this completely new way of styling your web applications. So, uh, so uh, the, I have a habit of whenever I see something that is very beautiful or very well engineered, I open the inspector in Chrome to see what they're made of. And this time something unusual happens. So let's see if you guys can spot it in this is a video. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so the thing is, uh, you look at the network panels, I am selecting the CS tab, and usually for most websites, you see some files loaded where the network. But for this Google Plus website, they don't have any CSS at all. Uh, yeah, so how could this be possible? How are they going to start the application without CSS? So it takes a bit of digging around to see that secret, and it's a bit peculiar why Google has chosen to do this strange way of not bundling any CSS file separately. But they actually, they put it inside uh, of their Java JavaScript. So you can see this uh, underlying line here is that all of the CSS for the, the home page is bundled inside the main JavaScript bundle. So uh, this is like this is very strange because it's contradict what I know about like programming for the web because since I was in university, CSS was the way that we start applications. <coughs> so what is the reason that we will have decided to go against uh, the traditional way and instead trying to use JavaScript to sign the applications. So what is the shortcoming of CSS that they want to do like to avoid? So first let's go back like 20 years in the past to see a bit of history of CSS. So this is a screenshot of web Apple like 20 years ago. And at that time the web was a very very like simple simple place. You only have a, like a bunch of tables, a few styles that you can make your page. So most of the web pages really really like plain. Uh, so that was the like the, the status quo at that time. So CSS was invented like in 1994, just like four years after HTML. And uh, initially they are, are like intended for a very simple document. So. Oh, and at that time they already have VR, if you notice it. <laughs> so yeah, it's not a new thing. So like fast forward to like today, 20 years later, we are now in the age of like very uh, highly interactive applications, highly dynamic web apps, and our CSS spec is like so huge now that I doubt that it's ever changed and no one has ever read it. So however, there's something fundamentally unchanged about CSS, which is uh, CSS is like a, a originally invented for like a single single page model applications, a very static document. But your web apps, your web apps now is more like a real application, your desktop applications, uh, with like a lot of interactivities, dynamic behaviors, and that is the main like challenge for CSS. Also, the main pitfall for CSS. This the model is built on. So because of this model, uh, it leads to a host of problems, uh, you can see here, and we'll go into details later. 
So, uh, so recently, there's a trend that um, people realize that you can, uh, like, you can bypass all this problem uh, with a new paradigm, which is called CSJS. So, what is it actually? So, first of all, I want to clarify that uh, CSJS is not like writing in life style, so it's very different things. CSJS, um, more generally, in my opinion, is like you, you process your styling, you keep your style in your applications, uh, JavaScript code, and you like you leverage the existing uh, compilers technique or the like infrastructure you already have for JavaScript, which is already very mature, to solve this problem of CSS. So uh, this area is so like such an open field. Like uh, people has a lot of opinions on how to solve this problem. That you can see there are like twenty like small libraries to write CSS in JS. So it's a good thing and a bad thing. So good thing is that uh, it's a lot of like new ideas coming, but the bad thing is that nobody agrees on what is the right thing to do. But for the today purpose, I'm not going into any of these libraries. Uh, I just go like uh, to discuss the approach in general for all these library. Uh, but I will use this syntax of this particular library, uh, Emotion. So the first problem of CS is that uh, they have a global namespace. So uh, as you may know that your CS file is actually a very big chunk of global namespace uh, for like global variables. So the first problem is that uh, you might have collisions. So how to avoid collisions? So you have to think of new class name all the times and this is not scalable. Uh, you can't think of like unique class name, you can not guarantee the uniqueness, then your components will have like unexpected styling because uh, in CSS the orders matters. So the global variable are not cool. This is what you learn in like software engineering 101 and we are still using this in CSS every day. So um, yeah, so the next slide is uh, somewhat funny but sometimes I find it also very true. Is you spend a lot of time like coming up with CSS class name. So there are a few approaches that people have think of before CSS in JS to, to tackle this global namespace problem. So uh, does anyone still rem remember the like EEM? Uh, if you don't, uh, it stands for like block elements and modifiers. So basically, it's a strategy for you to to create new class name that are like have high chance of being unique. So uh, the first one, for example, you have an item card, and in your item card you have like a subcomponents like like buttons. You can have several state like active harbor or something. Then uh, you can uh, almost have three levels like that. So the good thing is that uh, it bring a bit of like orders to all this chaos. Um, however, there are some downside, which is you still they are still global variables, and the name is freaking long. And you have to remember the, the what is the BEM stands for because sometimes you can be very confused and maybe your your naming is not correct according to the BEM standard. So and even you can gonna run out of name uh, like with our app scale. So the second approach is that uh, CS modules. Uh, CS module is. Um, it's better than the, uh, than, uh, the BM. So here's you, how you're going to write your CS modules. So basically, now all the names in your CS file is not global anymore. It's only unique uh, with regards to your application scope. So uh, if you look on the left side, uh, on the right side, you can see that uh, you just import the style and then you can use the dot container which is the CSS class over here. Uh, so through some like Bible translations, then your class name will become like uh, some hashing, uh, uh, some hash, and they are less like likely to clash with each other. So if you leave this like uh, talk today and you don't like CSS in JS, at least please try to use CSS modules because they are much better than yeah, the other things. Uh, next, we have the Shadow DOM, which is uh, quite, a, quite a good solution. 
So the thing is that uh, Shadow DOM introduced a scoping to your DOM tree. For example, uh, a lot of the time you see that each web, web like each browser should have their own video players. And actually they are still implemented by using, not using native code, but using real uh, like HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But they want to avoid like some guys like using jQuery to change all their like the elements styling. So how they do that is they separate the, the scope for their components, and you can only access that using Shadow DOM. The thing is that uh, with Shadow DOM you don't have any brothers that is supporting it at all. So actually Chrome is supporting the version zero of Shadow DOM. Uh, besides Chrome, no no one is supporting really. And Chrome is going to remove it in version 73, which is <laughs> that means that now nobody really support uh, like Shadow DOM anymore, at least with the current version version zero. So how CSS ingest going to solve it? So uh, you don't write your uh, CSS in your like in a separate file anymore. That's the first thing you notice, and you just write plain CSS. So uh, then the, the CSS ingest library, uh, either via like compile time or run time, they going to change this into a hash. And uh, the approach is pretty similar to CSS modules. Um, yeah, so but uh, you don't have the concept of CSS file. So that's how it's so. Uh, the second problem with like CSS is that sometimes you find yourself to have the need of sharing constant between your CSS file and JavaScript file. How do you do that? Uh, so there's not no other way than you have to keep it in two files. For example, I keep in my JavaScript file for the components and also in the CSS file. Uh, the problem with this is sometimes you just forgot to update one of the files. Uh, it can become a problem when new develop come in and then he is not like aware of there's a need to synchronize these two values. So with CSS in JS, uh, I don't know how to, uh, elast I don't have a slide to, to, to say that how they solve this problem because you don't have this problem at all. Because you just have the JavaScript. So every constant is stored in JavaScript. You don't have two places. So a lot of problems come with, come with CSS is that you have to maintain things. You have to synchronize things between two files. Uh, third problem is that for dead code eliminations. So as you may know, when we are growing our apps, uh, our compiler is really, really helpful. For, for example, Aclify will like, uh, prune out dead branches for your code or remove unused like variables or constant. But for CSS, there's currently there's no way to do that, or it's very convoluted to do that. So for the, for for the <coughs> example, let's try to use a batch for Shopee item cart. So one day uh, we had to support these two features called group by and bundle view, and each of them had like a like a different badges, and they had different colors. So. Because of the, uh, the nature of building a feature is that feature may come and go. Some feature for our like, uh, usage. So one day you have to remove one of them. For example, uh, group by, no one use it anymore. So how do you remove the, the remaining CSS file, the remaining uh, declarations? So simple, I just do a search and remove, right? But this thing is very prone, error prone, uh, because you you might not know that who is still using this class name, who is still calling it. Maybe it's not your component is still calling this, but some other guy who include the components and want to override your style, they want to change it. Then you don't know about all of this thing. So basically, you are doing all the dependency management yourself. How is this solved in CSS in JS? So as you can see here, uh, if I have two variations, I just keep two uh, style, like this object style here. And let's say I don't use the bundle view style anymore, then the compiler either warn me that I don't use it anymore, or at the compile time, they can just prune it out of your code. So it's not a problem because you are leveraging JavaScript compilers. 
So uh, this is possible due to uh, the current toolings we're having. For example, we are using Webpack. So Webpack has the ability to tree shape uh, your, your file. And Apple Files.js can do the deco elimination. And we have been using this tool like for ages. And the next problems, and also it's a very like uh, interesting problem is that uh, in CSS you have to manage the dependencies. So what do I mean by that? So let let's look at this button. Uh, can anybody can anybody tell me what is wrong with this file? Let's say I have this button was uh, JavaScript file. What is wrong with it? So the so the thing is, you forgot to import your CSS, <laughs> right? So why is this a problem? So let, let's consider this uh, like this example. Uh, on the home page, you have you have two pages, home page and product page, and they both include your beautiful buttons. But in the home page, you have some other components which already import the button styling, right? It can happen some way because it's a dependency tree. Somebody can already import it before you. So you will not recognize this problem if you import in the home page. But let's go to the product page. Nobody imports your styling, so your styling is suddenly gone. So that's what happens, right? Uh, uh, it's very frustrating when we are developing on our local machine and we say that, oh, it's fine now. But when you get to QA, they have some very convoluted orders, they have has a lot of combinations, so they find out this case, and good luck with reproducing that. <laughs> it's very hard. So in CSS in JS, it's not possible because there's no way for you to not import in your style because you have to declare your style. So the order you import is not important. So, this point is very closely related to the next point I will talk about, which is like an indeterministic res resolution. So uh, one question for you, uh, what color is the text here? <laughs> Interview question. <laughs> Hmm? Not enough. No, no, no. I, I will import the CSS, so what will happen? Yeah. Not enough information. <laughs> yeah, so the <laughs> thing is, we don't know. <laughs> the th so, uh, CSS, there's a rule in CSS is that the last rule with the same specificity in will. So let's say you have both classes, like button and button primary. They have the same specificity, let's say one. But uh, you will not know which one is the last rule declared in the CSS file, right? Remember that CSS is a global namespace. So whichever is declared last, win-win. So let's say you have a situation when, uh, when the button is imported before the button primary. Then button primary will override the button, which will render the colors to be red. But if it's the other way around, then your colors will be white. And there's no way for you to, 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 to fix this thing other than like you have to write important rule, right? A lot of important rule and that's even a bigger problem than, than these problems. So how do you solve this in CS in JS? Very simple. You just have this dynamic behavior built in. You can base on the attribute of the buttons to render your style. Uh, specifically for these components. So you don't depend on any, any orders of the CSS file at all. So I suspect that this problem is, recently I see this problem a lot with our Shopee, uh, because of now we are changing to the dynamic loading of CSS. So all the CSS file, like previously it was like a big, like 700 KB of one file, now it's like 10 files, and it can uh, comes in in any order, depending on how you browse our page. So this is more prevalent to us right now. So, so that is about all the, the, the problems, the, the most notable problems I can think about CSS and how CSS and JS can 
and consult them. But uh, so the next section, I'm gonna talk about what is the downside using CSS in JS because yeah, they are not just all like uh, sugar and sweet. So, oh, the first thing is that you have runtime overhead. So, uh, so many of the CSS library I just mentioned, they will actually do all the compilations. For example, polyfilling your flexbox or grid layout, or like vendor prefixings at runtimes. So, they will incur your 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 runtime cost. And also, sometimes they will try to insert the CSS rule like whenever your component is rendered. So it can be also a source of slowness. But I think uh, this is more like an implementation details than the, because you can always make your code uh, statically analyzable. Uh, just as the Google Plus uh, example that I just showed you, they do it just once. So maybe just the tooling is not like catching up fast enough. So I think this is uh, might be solved in the future. Second is that we don't have enough tooling support. So that's why you have see like have seen like twenty libraries now, because each of them like think uh, there are certain way that CSS in JS has to be implemented. Each of them come with like, their own trade off, and yeah, this is a very still a much open field for us and yeah, the compiler support is not there. And finally, the most like critical thing is that you cannot support non-JavaScript browsers because uh, if you want to keep your CSS in JavaScript, then for browser that turn off JavaScript support, you cannot show it. But uh, for j browsers with, if you are using CSS plainly, then you can support it. Still, I think uh, there are some libraries, CSS and JS library, <coughs> that they can separate your CSS out into a CSS file, and maybe that's a way to support this use case. So to sum up my, my talk, uh, yeah. this is not about CSS is going to die soon. It's just about like uh, the way you write it must be different, and it's a approach towards like, investigating. Uh, yeah. So thank you for listening.